Hello, my fellow Ripplers. This is Chris Miles, your cash flow expert and anti financial advisor. Chris Miles was able to retire twice by the time he was 39 years old, but he's not content to just enjoy his own financial freedom and peace of mind. Chris wants you to have your own ripple effect so you can live free today. He's not the financial advisor you expected. He's the anti-financial advisor you deserve. He's jumping behind the mic right now, ready to make waves. Here's Chris Miles. Guys, this is show is for you. Those that work so hard for your money and you're now ready for your money, start working harder for you today. You want that freedom of cash flow now, not 30 or 40 years from now, but you want it today so that you can live that life that you love with those that you love. But most importantly, guys, it's not just about getting rich. It's about living a rich life because as you are blessed financially, you now have a greater capacity to bless the lives of others. And that is a ripple effect I'm here to create. Thank you for allowing me to do so through you. Thank you for tuning in, binging and sharing these episodes and applying these things so that you can prosper yourself and create a greater ripple effect. All right, guys, if you haven't done so already, be sure to go check out our website, moneyripples.com. There's lots of great information there. And of course, we even got these as done as blogs transcribed. So if you're a reader rather than a watcher, that's not me, but if it's you, wonderful, you can go on there and check that out as well. All right, guys, so I'm really excited about this episode today because I wasn't able to witness this live. Usually I go to this conference with Dennis that is incredible. And I got to watch the recording instead after the fact because I was you know, helping my wife get nursed back to health. And I'm telling you, this guy is brilliant. Um, so I brought on Ted Oakley on our show here today. Ted is really not just the, I mean, not only been in the industry for 40 years, he's actually the, the owner of Oxbow Advisors. We'll talk about that here in a little bit as well. Uh, not to mention a, a big giver's servant's heart. Uh, the guy has actually started two charities, uh, the Foster Angels of South Texas, as well as for Central Texas, which has literally helped tens of thousands of foster kids across Texas now. We'll probably ask more about that. But uh, the one thing that's great about this, uh, yes, I'm bringing on an advisor. I know this might shock you, but um, this guy is no normal advisor. This is not your typical run-of-the-mill financial salesperson in a suit trying to sell you on mutual funds. This guy knows his stuff. And I can really attest to that. Not to mention, man, uh, his background, we got to get into it a little bit. So, Ted, welcome to our show today. Thanks a lot, Chris. So the first thing I got to ask you, I saw in your bio here that you're raising a home with no indoor plumbing or running water, and you even started basically saving for college at age six with your first job. Tell us more about that. Well, I, I don't think, uh, Chris, that I'm so unusual. I know a lot of people that watch your show probably too came from tough backgrounds. And so I don't try to stand out in that respect, but I'll tell you, you know, it was on the uh, North Carolina, Georgia line and we were basically what they call hillbillies at the time. And it was a, just a shack. I mean, it was my grandmother's two bedroom house. So what happened is, you know, you're in a small house and you've got a lot of people and we didn't have any money. I mean, my, my father was, um, was a Pentecostal minister and that's a, if you don't know anything about it, that's a extremely strict religion. And so uh, I spent most of my time by myself, really working, even as a little kid. And I started a job at six years old. I don't, I never did not have a job the rest of my life, even till now. And that's okay too. But it was, you know, you learn a lot like that. You know, you get a lot of adverse, adversity, but I will tell you, it creates a lot of uh, resilience, which I think people need to be resilient in order to be successful in life, as I'm sure a lot of your followers on this show are. And um, so my hat's off to them. And now you're in Austin area, correct? With owning Oxbow Advisors, right? I do. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've had, you know, different investments over time. I've invested in private businesses, real estate, part of a really good community bank as well. And so I sort of know the landscape as far as that goes. And I've sold companies, so I know how people feel about that too. Yeah, that was one thing that that intrigued me too is that you actually own a bank, um, or I have ownership in a bank, correct? Right. Uh, I'm not a I'm not I'm not the majority owner, but but I'm certainly one of the one of the owners. I'm on a holding company, so we're we're in the decision making process for sure. That's incredible. Well, what even got you into this down this path to where you are today? I mean, what I mean, obviously you've been working, but what got you interested in the money game specifically? Well, what got me interested was we. I was working for a food company called Anderson Clayton Foods in Dallas. And if you know anything about the food business, your readers or your watchers, I'm sure they know that it's a very low margin business unless you own it. And I had taken this one line they had, it was a shortening line, and I had doubled the sales and 
actually dropped one uh, uh, one one person salesman. So should have been really profitable, which it was. And you know, they called me in, gave me a two percent raise, and I said, "Well, that that won't work." You know, I've I've had enough things go wrong in my life where I'm I'm not particularly fearful of anything. So I mean, not that I don't have any fear, but you know, I've <laughs> I've been up against the wall a lot. So I said, "No, that won't work for me." And I just got lucky. I've been helping so much in my life with people. One of my good friends said, "Hey, uh, I think if you go down and talk talk, talk to this guy Merrill Lynch, he'll he'll send you to New York." And sure enough, uh, you know, I tested out and I went up, started on Wall Street and I uh, came back to Dallas and went with a private company later on, too. But that's how it all cranked up. And I like the business. You know, I, it's it's a lot like sports. You have to be with it every day and know what you're doing. Well, and now you're you're kind of in this this game right now. And you hear a lot of conflicting things in the media right now. Right. Because we hear a lot of people saying, you know what, we avoid a recession. That soft lending was so soft. We didn't even feel it. Um, we're just taking off again. You know, 2024 could be great. You'll hear a few people say, you know, even just recently we heard uh, from, I believe it was Goldman Sachs CEO, uh, Diamond, right? It said, hey, I'm I'm seeing something more dangerous on the horizon. But uh, but we got everybody else saying, no, we're good. What, what's your viewpoint? What, what are you watching right now to really sift between what's fluff and what's real? Well, you know, there's two camps on it, Chris. And some people are talking about, you know, we're in the early cycle of something going the other way, going up. And some people think, well, no, we're in the late cycle. I don't see how people get to early cycle. Let me tell you why. Here we are with very low unemployment. So it's not going to go any lower and uh, very little, that's for sure, because you're full on, you know, full on right now. Also, you have very tight money. You have everything breaking down. We're seeing, I'm starting to see a lot of things the last two months where Buildings are given back to, you know, the lenders. I'm seeing people with cash calls, all sorts of things going on. That's not early cycle. That's late cycle. That's where you're getting ready to have more trouble. And I think that's where we are right now. And they keep talking about the consumer being really whole and in great shape. Well, the consumer is not in great shape. You know, I can show the numbers, but if you look at their borrowings and where they are and what they're making, I think they're spending the the money they have sort of in a last hurrah, but I'm 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 thinking the next three quarters will be pretty tough. Yeah, it's and I know you have different data on this too because uh, you know just recently we had consumer spending coming out, retail sales were up beyond what people expected, right? And that sounds like everything's booming, and people can interpret that as good news or bad news depending on which side, right? Either like you said, it's either early cycle or late cycle. Um, some are looking at it as bad because the Feds might raise rates again. Um, which they're probably going to do anyways, but still, like I know you have a slide right here. It says is consumer st- the consumer still strong, and you're showing evidence that's saying maybe prices are going up or retail sales are up, but are the is the consumer really able to keep up with this? Well, and that was just for the month of August. I think September actually, when we run everything down, will be worse. But I think what people forget about is that of all the things that are sort of coming at them, and the fact that we're going we're probably running out of any of the free money that was left over. But what mm-hmm. happens with the consumer right now is that, and I, I've just noticed this, just listing, I, I guess living all three socioeconomic levels, I can I can really converse with anybody. One of the things I found about the lower lower income right now is that uh, whatever money they did have, they just, you know, they couldn't buy a house, couldn't buy a car, didn't have enough. So they said, hey, you know what, I'm gonna take a trip, I'm gonna do something fun and, you know, I'll worry about it tomorrow. Well, that's okay. But the problem is that's the end of the line. And I think when you look at auto sales, home sales, you know, just so many different things. If you look at, look at retail sales are down. Um, and you see people like Dollar General, who's they lower earnings estimates. Then you know that, and that's at the lower end, by the way. Uh, then you know you have trouble. Well, and I know you have, you, 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 you pulled up something I thought was really interesting too, is looking at utility shutoff rate. That looks like it's going up as well, isn't it? Well, it gives you an idea of what's happening. One of my research sources gave that to me. And what one of the things that people don't think about is they don't think about that sort of thing. I've always said, if you get behind and you have a lorem taxes, that's one thing. There'll be two or three years before the, a county or a city comes after you. But if you get behind on your water sewer, you know, you, you've got about a month. <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to cut you off. And I just think it goes to show what's going on out there that people are just, you know, they're just barely getting along week to week. And once you get down to that point where you're really not getting week to week, 
then you really have to start tightening the screws. And I think that's where we are right now. I remember in 2020 when a lot of the money supply was starting to just be flooded by the trillions in the market. I remember uh, some people that were, you know, more down on their luck, you know, they're, they were very, they were suffering, of course, already paycheck to paycheck. And then with this, of course, the government came swooping in to save the day, right. And pump money into them. And I remember I even said on the show three years ago, I said, well, all they're doing is it's kind of like the whole take from the rich and give to the poor. You know, if you look at a pool with different depths, you got the deep end, like the rich, the shallow end, like the poor, if you take out from the, the deep end of the pool, you just scoop it out dump it in the shallow end, it's still going to flow right back to the deep end again, right? Right. And and lo and behold, the one tax that people weren't talking about was inflation, which hurts the lower class much worse than it does the upper class. That's a fact. Yeah. It, you know, I think people don't realize, but we've had for the last really 25 years, we've had a completely irresponsible Federal Reserve. And I blame them and fiscal policy, by the way, during that 2021 period, the same way in that they just basically ruined the monetary system, I'll put it that way, because they made things uh, really set sort of a fake market. And that's that's how we ended up with all those things that don't mean anything. I know you've even mentioned too that the feds tend to lie, right? Like whatever they say, often they'll do the opposite. Can you give us some examples of that from before? Well, there's a lot of them really, but if you look at, you know, if you look at, uh, for I'll go all the way back to Bernanke, Bernanke talking before the housing crisis. He's, I've got him quoted saying, you know, it doesn't look like the housing crisis is going to throw us into a recession. Uh, that was prior to the, the big subprime meltdown. And then mm -hmm. you keep, you know, you go forward and, uh, and Janet Yellen, who would always talk about, uh, about a both sides of her mouth and she would say something, but do the opposite. Then you went on to Jay Powell and Powell in 18, I uh, said, you know, we're going to normalize our, you know, we're going to normalize interest rates. I'm coming in new and we're going to go back to like it should be, you know, back in the back in the 80s and 90s, like the like the Fed should do it. But sure enough, market fell in, in December and he flipped, you know, on a nickel. And he was, you know, within a month and a half, he was in there lowering rates again. And then, you know, you remember all of this, but he was talking about transitory inflation and inflation is always transitory, but there's a it can be four or five years transitory. Uh, no, he made it sound like it was only going to be a quarter. And so then he, you know, so you, they're, they're always saying one thing, doing another, but let's face it, they're all academics. And uh, most academics don't have an idea really what's happening on, on Main Street. True. And they're very wealthy academics at that. <laughs> they're they bankers, are. aren't they? Well, yeah, there's, I think there's, I don't know, my friend Lacey Hunt tells me there's, I think, 350 plus PhDs in the Federal Reserve. I mean, you know, why? <laughs> I guess it's <laughs> my question. Um, so that goes on, but it's always been the last federal, the last federal reserve chairman I, that I really could believe thought he had it together was Paul Volcker, but mm -hmm. uh, that's been a, a long time ago. And ever since then, it's just been up and down, up and down, trying to control the stock market and control the economy. And that's not their job, but that's what they've been doing. Well, and one thing you hear people talk about in the news often, they'll say that the consumer is resilient right now. Like they just don't slow down. They just keep spending. What do you think it really contributes to that? Because most people, I think, are expecting if the consumers are in a bad place, they're just going to be broke. They don't have any more savings left, right? Maybe they're running credit card balances up. But it, you know, last report, they're saying, well, credit card balances, they're still well below the limits overall. What are your thoughts on that? Well, they just started this. But if you look at balances, you know, they've been going up now a lot for the past six months. And now you've gotten the average average credit card rate up to about 22.2%, which is, you know, obviously nobody, no matter what they want to tell you in Washington, they're not thinking about the little people. Um, that's for sure. Not with 22%. And I, I threw in on that slide, you have my own, I just happened to look at my American Express, which I don't have any balances, but I wanted to see what they did charge. I, and I said this in, in, the, in the talk was it was 29.99%, which is they didn't have the guts to write 30. And you think about that, that's just, it's atrocious. I mean, there's no way a consumer can wade through that and, and, and it'll just keep driving them in the hole. Yeah. And I know you have another chart after you showed that personal interest payment showing that interest rate and the balance has definitely gone up. Yeah. Um, then you also have the savings rates going down too. Well, what's happening with savings is, you know, they got a blast of money 
you know, from various mm -hmm. things, you know, from unemployment from stay at home, you know, childcare. There's all, all so many credits that everybody got. And all of a sudden they had extra money that they never had before. And, but now they spent it really. I mean, if you look at the numbers there, by the time you get to the fourth quarter, 23, uh, they pretty much spend all the money. And so now they're yeah. pushing over into credit and credit only lasts so long. And then in delinquents are going up as well. So we'll just have to see how it plays out. And what do you think will happen as a result of this? Oh, I think it will break the consumer. And when it does, it will break, it'll break the profit cycle for companies. Uh, yeah. They're already starting to see it. They don't want to, you know, I just saw the number this morning. We're expecting fourth quarter earnings to be down, uh, you know, for the market in general, you know, 1.7, 1.8%. It's probably going to be more than that. You know, nobody wants to admit it and they can run the numbers around and sort of fool you any way they want to. But the bottom line is they're not doing as much business. Well, that that's, and that kind of leads to really like investment options, right? Because people say, okay, if we're moving to recession, now what? And I know traditionally uh, you have the quote unquote financial professionals will tell you, you got stocks, you got bonds. There's always this, the traditional 60, 40, which people have been, you know, questioning and debunking for quite a while now already. But I think not many people realize that even if you're in stocks and even if you have bonds, you're not really diversified, are you? Not really. I think people... What's happened is you have a whole set of people, not only in the industry, but people that gave advice to people that have only been around since 2009. And so all they've ever seen is very, very low interest rates and a robust stock market. Nothing could ever go wrong because the Fed would come in lower rates if it did. And so you, it, that's, that's the backdrop of all these people. And if my advice to person is don't necessarily believe all of that, you need to start looking out for yourself because what happens in here is that we're probably leaving the 60-40 look more than likely, especially with a 5.5% 90-day treasury you bond a bill. You can't, you know, that's hard to beat. Make sure you can weather the storm. I, you know, I use a, I always have something we use in the firm called base capital and investment capital. I don't have the slide in here, I don't think, but what it means is we always have a certain amount of money, no matter how much money you have, you should have a certain amount of money we call base capital and it's bulletproof. In other words, you're not going to make a ton of money on it. Now you make good money on it or it's still even now, but normally it's not going to be your biggest returner. However, it's the one that allows you to not get caught up in emotions on ups and downs and allows you to stay, stay steady. And, and people, I think, I think people, they don't have that today, uh, unfortunately, but they need it. Uh, they need some of that base capital there because it may be sort of rocky here the next year or two. Yeah, it's it's fascinating because you know you've you've heard of course Buffett's type of philosophy as well as several others will say whenever the crowd's running running one direction you run the opposite right and uh -huh. and so when I start hearing in early 2022 don't you dare hold the cash because you'll lose to inflation you got to invest all of it I thought maybe this is the time to start holding cash and you know obviously I don't just hold it in a bank earning point nothing percent but. You know, I mean, for example, we we talk a lot about infinite banking and especially like having cash rich whole life policies and things like that. And so I started moving more of my money over there. And of course, as interest rates rise, so do our dividends. You know, it's kind of nice to watch that, that benefit as well. I mean, what, what are your thoughts about good places to hold base capital? Well, I'm, I might add that Warren Buffett, they talk about Buffett, but if you look at when he has a lot of cash, he'll tell you it's not a, a market timer, but he's a value timer. Yeah. And that tells you where he is. And right now in the last, you know, since that time you talked about, he has more cash than he's ever had. And yeah, he's really not billion it. as a few yeah, months not, ago. I'm using a ton of it. See, so what I recommend to people is depending on what you want to do, but if you really, really want to be, make sure it's really safe, you're going to have to go with a CD or a treasury bill, a bill, one mm -hmm. of the two, you know, and you can go out a, a year or two because then your downsides, I have to hold it a year or I have to hold it two years. It's not a bad idea, but for that money, it has to be where you can get your hands on it uh, without it changing in value very much. That base capital right. can't fluctuate much on you. And so uh, now is a great time for it because it's five and a half percent on, on the 90 day and uh, people forget, but on the treasury, you don't pay any state income tax. Now, you you might not pay state if it's a CD out of a bank in your state, but most people don't buy them like that, and they end up with a CD somewhere else maybe, and they end up, they see that has state tax on it. But the treasury, 
it's it's clean. It's just federal tax. And can, you think people can still trust the Treasury? Well, we have to trust what we have. If you get into a situation where the Treasury bill and the and the bonds are not any good, then there's a lot worse things going on at that point uh, that you'll have to be worried about. Probably food. Uh, as much as anything, because that's a medium of exchange for us. It yeah. is a problem. I don't know where it ends. I mean, we have too much debt, obviously, in this country, and we're we're piling it on. If you if you if if you go to a, a site called debtclock.org, you'll see it's auto automatic. You've probably seen it, Chris. It updates mm -hmm. by the second, and it'll blow your mind at how much debt you pile on in a twelve hour period. I mean, blow your mind. We're uh, we're down that road, and really, we don't have anybody worried about it up in Washington. So you got to worry about yourself, you know. So, you know, don't go long on the paper. Maybe own a little gold, have some income, produce some real estate. Try to have some cash flow because that'll get you through everything. Yeah, you don't want to trust the north, the the Richmond north of Richmond, right? <laughs> you know what? It's a great song. I actually, uh, I, I have I have to agree with the guy. I know it made him really popular, but um, I think it did. Anyway, I've listened to his song a number of times. I think people feel that way, actually. I don't care. You know, I think they just feel like, hey, nobody listens. Nobody cares. You're not worried about us. You're lining your own pockets. I think people generally look at that. And, and if you look at most of these uh, reps and senators, you know, when they come out of being there for 12 years, 16 years, whatever, you know, they've made a lot of money. How? <laughs> yeah. You know? People don't trust, the, and I'm, they're probably as low as I've ever seen it. They don't trust the government, and and rightly so, actually. So I, I know you have a kind of a you had a slide here, and you were talking about this already about the proper allocation of what you can do with with stocks, because obviously there's still a lot of speculation. I know you actually had a chart on there about uh, stock options, you know, paying eight or ten percent a month. Which every time people have asked me about that, I said, watch, even if it doesn't get, you know, even if it doesn't fail, which they usually do, SEC will shut it down. But so people are trying to look for a place to put it. Um, you kind of have your own, you know, like you say, your 30, 30, 30, 10. Uh, tell us a little bit more in depth about that. Well, what what I thought is after after this great four decades of lower interest rates, and they bought, let's I mean, face it, they bought them in 20, April or May, whatever it was, when we had the 10-year, uh, you know, down around 40 basis points or so. And I think I think that probably was the bottom, all-time bottom for interest rates. And so what happens from here? is that, you know, I'm thinking and, and, and everybody on the street and all these advisors are going to want to tell you, just put your 60% in stocks and the 40% in bonds. And 20 years later, you're going to be just fine. Well, mm -hmm. I can give you periods, by the way, from 1929 to 1948. I can give you periods of 1966 to 1983, from 2000 to two, through 2012. You may, made no money in the market, zero I'm talking about. And I think people always forget about that. And so I think this decade is going to be more of where you'll have 30% probably in more of a, a value type stock. If you look at Wall Street, what they've flung on people this last five years has been SPACs and NFTs and crypto coins and, I can, and so many companies that don't make any money, nonprofits, high yield, just all the junk you want to talk about. Okay, it's what's thrown out there. So you're what I think is that'll go away and you'll have 30% in what is what a truly valuable company. And then you'll have 30, you know, then you'll have 30% in uh, short-term uh, bonds. When I'm that, I mean, less than 60 months. And then I think you'll have 30% in some sort of commodity type. It doesn't have to be a metal or something like that, but it needs, it can be some, you know, but it can be some metals. It can be real estate. It can be farmland. Something that offset, offsets inflation. I think that'll be really important. Uh, for me, you know, I have uh, oil and gas minerals. I have private companies. I have real estate. That I look at all that as a mix uh, of, a, of, a, of a hedge, you know, in inflation. And then just 10% in cash. And I think between the 10% in cash and the 30 in the value stocks, you will have to learn when to trade. In other words, there's times when you put a lot of money in the market and there'll be times when you take a lot of money off because we'll be in that kind of time frame where I'll give you a really good example. My first nine years in the business, the Dow Jones just went from 750 to 1,050, and it did it about every 18 months. If you didn't know when to really deploy cash, then you never made any money. And I, I think we have raised up a whole group of people or so-called advisors in our business 
that won't have a clue as to how that works. And that's what I see over the rest of the decade. And that's one thing I was going to ask you about, the, like the, the market in general. And the S&P, I know the S&P is hard to use. It's not like using the Russell or the value index or something like that, because that's skewed 33% with the top 10 stocks out of the 500, right? Right. But I know it's like with the trend line of the S&P, you know, if you draw it from like the last, really since the 1920s till now, it really, if it were to come back, ba bounce off that trend line like it did back in 2008, it would have to hit like 1900, <laughs> yeah. way lower than it is now. I mean, do you think it will do something? It might even come back down again, or do you think it might just stay flat and just keep, you know, really just be non-returning for us? Do you think there's anything like that might happen? Well, Chris, I don't know if it's 2000, but I think you have to come back to at least 3000 just to this idea of returning to the mean is a good point. But the main point is that if you look over time, the S&P, uh, it, 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 it moves around like it'll move up into the high 20s on the multiple of earnings to 12 on the low side, maybe 10. I saw it at single digits uh, a couple of times in my career too. So you have a time span in there. And what you have to do is, I think at least, I think we've been, see, we've been stuck up here. Uh, if you look at forward earnings right now, it's 21 times. I mean, that's, yeah, that's not a cheap market by any stretch. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and you've got a competition uh, with five and a half percent money uh, with doing nothing. And so it gives you, it gives you an idea. And I do, I don't think, I don't know if I have this in there, but I, I, I say to people, look, the market today is exactly where it was two years ago. Exactly. No change. Okay. So this idea that we've been in some sort of bull market, it just doesn't fly. We're not in a, we're not in there. We're in a cycle market down that peaked in December of 21 and it's still, that's still the peak. And so yeah. that's where we are right now. Yeah. Some people are like, Oh, it's just a, you know, little, little bounce. No, it's, that's kind of a more of a bearish move right now from the looks of it. Well, I, I caution people against this. If you take a million dollars and you lose 25% of it. Okay. And then the, in the next year, let's say, you know, let's say the next year that you make 25%, by the way, you're still underwater. <laughs> yep. So I, I think they don't realize that, uh, you know, they still lose money. And I think they right. think, you know, they just look at this year, like I'm up X. Okay. Well, yeah, I know, but you're still down actually. And so, yeah. you know, they've got to stop and look at that. Yeah. You lose 20%, you need 25% to get back to zero. You lose 25, right. you need 33, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Exactly. Well, and one more thing, I, well, I want to ask you one more question too, to kind of go along with this, but before I do, kind of like a quick break here. Um, so Oxbow Advisors, tell us what you do with that that firm. Well, I'm I'm one of the, we don't have just a single chief investment officer, but particularly I have a, a another person, Chance Finucane, that's a, we, is a chief investment officer. And he and I pretty much, we set the roadmap for the firm and where we want to be. Uh, we don't run a lot of, uh, uh, I think returns will be lower for stocks over the decade and, and people need to sort of try to adjust to that and, and get their cash balances up strategies. We only have three, really. I know it sounds simple, but for us, simple is this. One strategy is bulletproof. One strategy is all stocks and one in the middle is all cash flow. And so we think that covers the spectrum of what people want or need. And depending on their level of what they can stand with volatility, we we slot them toward that. We have a lot of people who don't have much stock at all because that's who they are, you know? And we don't try to change that. We try to listen out and see uh, what people are saying. And I always tell all the portfolio managers, if somebody tells you something, usually, you know, you need to believe it because they're probably telling, <laughs> telling you the truth. So that that's what we try to do. And we don't try to push something unknown or something that we think is different from what they're thinking. You have to match those two things up. And that's the worst thing people do. They either overestimate or they underestimate their risk tolerance. And that's a bad thing. Very true. A good point. Yeah, we'll be sure to put that in the, the show notes with you at the link to your site and everything too. All right. Um, I want to also have you talk about your your charity for a little bit. Tell us about tell us about this. Well, you know, I was um, I was neglected quite a bit as a child, and it I so I understand neglect. I was loved. I'm, I'm not saying that, but but I was certainly neglected. And one of the things I started doing, we started uh, really, oh, it's been 27 or 28 years ago in the first foundation, is I just. Uh, went to one of the regions uh, for foster kids and uh, the head of the region said, hey, you know, I, I'm, I think I think I'd like to spend the same amount of money I spent on the country club uh, on foster children. 
Well, that didn't last long because the, the requests I got that were so meaningful to me and I started spending so much money, I said, you know, we're going to have to have a, fun, a foundation. I filed it with the IRS and I know to this day that agent was a foster child because she said, if you'll switch this from a private foundation to a public foundation, you can help a lot more kids. So that's what we did. So today we help, you know, about 10,000 kids a year between the two foundations. You know, you don't, you don't turn them all around. I mean, but what you try to do, our motto has been that if you, if you can change your thinking, you can change your life. And uh, we certainly changed some lives. And hey, you know what? That's about as rewarding as anything you can do. That's exactly the ripple effect we talk about here. I love that. And we'll also, I'll get the information for you as well to put that in the show notes for anybody who wants to check out that, that charity. I know we have a lot of Texans that follow us here, but even if somebody's outside of Texas, I'm sure they can be involved as well, correct? Oh yeah, we, you know, we, we, uh, we, we get involved. In fact, we help, uh, if we get a, a request for a foster child out of state, you know, we, we help that child too. We're, we're not just germane to those regions. And I personally help a lot of kids, you know, just if I see one in need, they don't have, even have to be a foster child. I think, I think even when I didn't have a lot of money, I gave back. And I think that's, people always say, well, I don't have enough money, but it's funny when you give back, it comes back to you. I don't, I don't, I don't give back to do that. It's just that I never miss it. And mm -hmm. so I always tell everybody the feeling you get from helping people is worth everything. And I think, I think that's what you sort of owe the world to be a person like that. And, and that's what we try to do. It's true. It's kind of like tithing. Like whenever I, we've seen tithing on people's cash flow numbers, it's like, great. That's the best investment you can make. You know, yeah. it might look like an expense, but uh, I've, I know my, my situation has always been the more you give, the more you end up receiving too. Well, I'll give you an example. I gave a, I'm, I'm, Pisc I'm in Episcopal church now, and, and, but I gave a stewardship speech. Oh, this has been probably a dozen years ago now, maybe, maybe a little longer, but I said, when you're giving today, you're not giving so that you can, you know, paint the walls or redo the building or do that. What you're giving for are those kinds of people that come in here. And they may be getting a divorce. They may have cancer. They may be real sad. Somebody died. Whatever it is, what you're doing is you're you're creating some legacy to go forward. And so when you think about it, you want to give for legacy. And yes. 100 years from now, they're not going to know who you are. But if you change a lot of lives from that point forward, you know, you really made a difference. And that's how I look at giving. I love that. Great perspective. Well, so I'll come to the last question here because this show is all about cash flow. And you mentioned having investments that cash flow. Uh, when you say that, what do you mean by that? Well, I think people have to understand that any investment that turns out to be great cash flows. You can say uh, that it cash flows and I put it all back into the business. That's okay. But it's still cash flows. Cash flow to me is the mother of what makes everything go. And, to, and I think that's what happens so much. The last five years, we got completely away from cash flow. All these companies yes. that didn't make any money and, and, and NFTs and big, you know, all the coins, all the SPACs, all that sort of stuff. But cash flow is what makes it happen. You look at all great investors, they get cash flow. I mean, they either get dividends or they get interest or they in, in real estate, you know, they get rents and businesses, they get dividends from making the business work. That's, that's the point. And I don't think I try to tell people this all the time. You are never going to get, if you want to call it rich, you will never get rich by having non-cash flow investments because <laughs> you're never going to get there. And you're going to have to have things that cash flow one way or the other. Amen to that. Well, Ted, I really appreciate your time today. You've been very generous. Lots of great information. Uh, again, we'll put your contact in the show notes. Any final words of wisdom or inspiration or anything uh, for our listeners here today? I would say this, and I, I do have, I have a, a soft spot really for people that don't have a lot of money that meet minimums for firms like mine, that sort of thing. I, I don't, certainly don't mind sitting maybe than we're thinking, but I think, I think it's very hard for people today that have less than say 500000 or $600,000 to get any good advice. And so you're going to have to read more and you're going to have to look out for yourself more that's all the money you have and you can't afford to lose that money. So you have to really work at it to make sure you don't do something wrong. And if my advice would be during these kinds of times to look out for yourself. And if, and if you need to keep more money, 
liquid. Yeah, you know, maybe somebody bought the hottest stock of the year, but you know what? Uh, you know, it's like the tortoise and the hare. You'll get there, but you make sure that you take care of that money because Wall Street will try to sell you everything in the book. Uh, and it may, many cases, it's not good for you. So you need to watch out for yourself and just be careful in here, I'd say to people. Yeah, I always say, I would say it's more important to get a return of your money than a return on your money, right? That's Even though true. I like both, but... <laughs> There's got to be a priority to make sure you protect what you have and then make more with it. That's true. Yeah. Great counsel. Thank you so much, Ted. Again, everybody, you know, you heard it here. I say this just about every week, right? It's one thing, and, and Ted just said this, right? It's one thing to be a hearer of the word. It's another thing, another thing to be a doer of the word. And in this case, doer means you got to keep learning. You got to start building on that knowledge. And as you can do that, you can start to venture out and start to do things. But yeah, don't ever get caught up in the hype. Don't get caught in the FOMO, you know, the fear of missing out. Those are the things that cost people money. And that's why people never create wealth. They never get that freedom that we talk about in the show so often. So guys, make sure that when you hear this stuff, you're wise with it. Go and make it a wonderful and prosperous week. We'll see you later.